I've consolidated a bunch of your guys' questions from the last few months, and I thought today we would do another Q&A session. Hey guys, Liz here from The Nail Hub. And today I wanted to go through some of the questions that you guys have been leaving me on my YouTube channel. I really appreciate every time you guys interact with me and ask questions regarding videos that I've posted because I really, my whole point of having this channel is to really try and help everyone be very educated about their choices when it comes to nail care and the products that they use. So I wrote down several of the questions that kind of stood out to me over the last, I don't know, four months or so and wanted to go over some of them. Some of them I'm probably gonna make into actual full-on videos just because I feel like the answer warrants more information that can be you know, addressed in a Q&A video. Um, and for those of you that don't like long-winded me just talking videos, then this video might not be for you, but I think I've got some good content for you here. So if you're willing to stick with me, then I think um, you're gonna get some, some really great info out of this. Okay, so first question that I wanted to go over was, my nail lamp doesn't have a reflective base. How do I deal with that? Do you, you know, should I get a different lamp or, or what's the deal? And so I wanted to actually show you guys a quick trick. And this is also, even if your lamp has a reflect, reflective base, and what they mean by that is the base plate on the nail lamp is reflective. Now, I highly recommend that you guys have a nail lamp that Again, if you haven't watched my UV nail lamp video, go back and watch it. I did some great content with chemist Jim McConnell about UV and how UV is so important in properly curing the gels that we work with. Um, but I do really recommend a lamp that has a reflective surface because it's going to help balance that light around and make sure that you get the most light inside of your lamp at all angles and prevent things like shadows and, and things that can prevent our gels from curing. So. This is my, I mean, anybody's nail lamp usually is filthy unless you clean all the time, it'll usually be scratched. So your base plate usually comes off. Most nail lamps, the base plate will come off. And if yours is not reflective like mine is, it might be white plastic, it might be black, it might be you know any, any litany of colors. Um, quick trick is to use some aluminum foil. Aluminum foil is not only pretty cheap, but it's also a great way to protect your base plate. And especially these days when we're, you know, thinking about the effects of the pandemic and COVID-19, this is another great way to actually be able to dispose of a surface that a client has touched. Now, if you already have a reflective surface on your nail lamp, you can definitely do this with saran wrap. Um, I would recommend you stick with something clear. Don't use things like press and seal or stuff that has like more of an opaque finish or wax paper because it's got more of that opaque finish that's going to actually dull the reflection on your surface. But if you have saran wrap or cling wrap, um, you can wrap your base plate in cling wrap and it'll keep it from getting gel on it. It'll keep it from getting scratched and you can literally rip that off um, and, and dispose of it if you want to do that at every service or you can also do it at the end of every day and just you know disinfect the, um, the surface with uh, disinfectant spray or wipes or whatever you use. So literally, you're gonna take a sheet of tin foil, aluminum foil, I really like the non-stick kind, Reynolds Wrap, um, and again, it depends on what country you live in, but usually there's some kind of non-stick version of the aluminum foil or aluminum foil in the grocery store. Um, and so I like to do the non-stick side, and this one actually says non-stick side. I just find that stuff peels off of it a lot easier. So literally all I do is just wrap my base plate and just make sure it's completely coated like this. And then you can put it back underneath your lamp, line it up, and it will still magnetically click into place. You'll have some foil underneath, but it, once you press it down on your table, it'll sit nicely. And then inside your nail lamp, you've got this nice clean surface. Now, you can definitely take more care, make sure it's perfectly smooth inside. But I really like this just because, again, it protects the base of your lamp where most of the gel and stuff touches. And if you want to be able to you know, remove this, um, that's great. Or if your base plate in your lamp isn't reflective, this is a great way to make it reflective. So hopefully that helps some of you. All right, question number two is the conversation about 70%, 91%, or 99% uh, isopropyl alcohol. 
Um, some of you have told me you can't find isopropyl alcohol and that only ethyl alcohol exists in your country. They are extremely similar and they can both be used for a nail cleanser. Um, the biggest difference between 70, and I'm using these percentages because these are the ones that I most commonly see. There might be different percentages, but typically when we're talking about nail care, your alcohol ranges are gonna range from 70 to 99. Now, what those percentages mean is how much of the actual isopropyl alcohol is the alcohol portion and how much of it is water. So in a 70% formulation, if you're buying it from a pharmacy or buying it from a beauty supply, 70% of it's going to be the actual isopropyl alcohol and 30% of it is going to be water. So it's diluted. Again, 91%, right? We'd have 9% of it being water. 99 would be extremely high percentage of isopropyl alcohol and only 1% of it being water or any other type of, of dilutives, depending on what it is. But typically IPA is IPA plus water. Um, the challenge with 99% IPA, isopropyl alcohol, is that it evaporates so quickly that it actually doesn't have a chance to fully kill or um, or maim sometimes, depending on what it is, um, is to take care of the bacteria issue that we're trying to take care of on the nail plate. So the whole reason why we use things like IPA, mainly in nail services, is to remove bacteria. We also use it for cleansing off the inhibition layer of gel, that sticky tacky layer that's left behind after you're curing. We also use it to remove that, but the big thing is you don't really wanna to have to buy two different types of IPA. You really just wanna use one gel nail cleanser for both killing bacteria on the nail plate prior to product application and also being able to use it to cleanse the sticky layer off of your gel. So I like to use 91 um, and I do add in a little bit of acetone as you guys have probably seen in my gel nail cleanser video. Um, but if you're using 99, it's not going to have a chance to kill the bacteria. It's going to evaporate too quickly. It's not going to sit on the nail plate long enough. And so you can buy 99 and dilute it with distilled water if you would like to do that. Um, or you can just buy something like 70 or 91. On the flip side, 70 is going to have quite a bit of water in it. So you're going to need to let that dry completely before you put product on it. And also, again, adding in a dehydrative product like acetone is going to help with that. So it's going to help kill bacteria and then adding a dehydrator like acetone is going to help get the water off of the nail plate. So that's why a lot of nail cleansers that you see, if you actually look at the ingredients, usually have a mix of isopropyl alcohol and acetone or some other dehydration product. Um, and it's because we're trying to do two things at once. We're trying to kill bacteria and we're trying to get rid of water um, and so again, that's why I like to use 91 because it doesn't have as much water, but it is more expensive than 70. And um, you do need to make sure that you're saturating the nail plate enough with it. And so that has time to actually sit on the nail plate, kill the bacteria. But I've had a lot of success with 91 in my, gosh, I don't know, 10 years of doing nails now. Um, 91 has worked really well for me, but I know that there's differing opinions out there about using 70 because it sits on the nail longer and has a better chance of curing, uh, sorry, not curing, killing bacteria. Okay. So go back and watch my gel nail cleanser video. If you guys haven't watched that, um, you can absolutely use your own mix. And I just like to do my own because I find that branded cleanser, you know, it's difficult to get it shipped to me because I have to, you know, it's, it has to be done by ground shipment. Um, sometimes it's more expensive because it is branded. You know, the company has to bottle it, label it, package it. So I just like to buy my own generic and mix it myself. But absolutely, if you are dedicated to a specific nail system, you know, using their nail cleanser is a great option because it's going to eliminate, again, one more variable in your system, which means that that nail cleanser is made to work with their products. If you're using a different brand of nail cleanser, as I talk about in my gel nail cleanser video, you do run the risk of having other additives in it, which like scent, color, a whole bunch of different things that may not be compatible with the gel that you are using. And that can lead to some, you know, some issues. Um, all right, so I hope that makes that clear about the 70 versus 99 alcohol and what to use in between. And again, if you don't have IPA, uh, where you live, you know, you could use ethyl alcohol as well, or again, use a gel nail cleanser that doesn't have any additives in it. Look for something with no scent, no color, and look at the ingredients. And the simpler the list of ingredients, the better off you probably are going to be. Or if you use a specific gel system, definitely go with the branded cleanser that goes with your gel system. Because again, it's just going to eliminate a lot of 
mystery ingredients that might be leading to pulling or pulling um, on your pooling or pulling on your gel nail um, service. Okay, number three. Um, let's see here. Mixing back filling with a different product like soak off gel after using hard gel. And also I've gotten this question a lot and I used to come across this a lot when I was fully, you know, full time doing nails, which was I would have clients come in that had been, you know, getting their nails done somewhere else, whether they're traveling or maybe they, you know, went to a different salon before and maybe they would have some mystery product on their nails. Like, I mean, a lot of times I can figure it out just by filing a little bit. I can tell, you know, it's acrylic or I can tell it's some kind of gel system. Um, but I don't know if it's soak off or hard gel unless I remove it. And a lot of times the person just wants a backfill. Maybe they're traveling. They just want to get their nails filled in and they don't want to start from scratch and they're going to go back to their original nail technician. Um, so, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that? Well, one thing I would recommend, and again, I talked about this and why, why do gel nails chip and crack? And I talked about the different kind of rigidities with gel formulations and all of the different kind of formulations that are out there. So I'm just going to use a couple props. These don't mean anything other than I'm just using them for flexibility and rigidity. Okay, so if we're using a very flexible gel, it doesn't really matter whether or not it's soak off or hard gel. The only time this would matter is that if the nail tech that's doing the person's nails full time only uses soak off product and you backfill with a hard gel, it's going to cause some problems for the person if they go to remove this by soaking it off when the nail tech or when the client comes back. Um, but it's pretty hard for you to tell if it's a soak off product without actually attempting to soak it off. And as you guys know, if the nail, there's nothing wrong with the nail, like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, yeah, I don't like removing product unless absolutely necessary, just because it creates a whole another element of possible nail damage. You don't know what it is. Maybe it doesn't come off. Maybe it doesn't come off the way you think it's going to come off. Um, so when I was working in the salon full time and people would come in to, um, sorry, I have a very fuzzy cat and like literally he gets fuzz all over my face. Um, I would try to pick a product that went with the same flexibility and not so much worrying about whether or not it was soak off or hard gel. The only difference between soak off and hard gel is one can be soaked off with acetone and the other one cannot. But within hard gel and soak off gel, there are a lot of different flexibilities. So if the person's nail is extremely bendy and flexible, then I would probably pick a bendy and flexible gel to backfill with so that the person has the same type of product on their nails. If the gel is super rigid and when you squeeze it, it doesn't bend at all or hardly at all, then pick one of your gels that has those same type of properties because it's going to make a more uniform surface on the nail. Now, if the person has a super rigid surface, surface service and the gel is super hard and doesn't bend or flex and I put a really flexible soak off gel up by the cuticle, again, we're only backfilling maybe about that much space, okay? So is it really going to cause service breakdown? No, but it is going to add a really weird flexible spot in their service, which is ultimately probably going to get covered up with another rigid layer and it's going to get sandwiched at some point. Um, so it, it can kind of change the properties of the actual nail service, which can sometimes cause problems. And I would argue that it's it's a little bit more awkward when you're trying to, with a super flexible nail, you're trying to put hard gel over it. The flexibility underneath can sometimes cause the two products to like pop or this one's going to start cracking depending on how flexible the underneath part of it is. So just think about the type of things that you're layering. And again, if it's not that far off as far as flexibility is concerned, like if they're very similar, then you're probably in good shape. But just keep that in mind because if we have a super flexible nail out here and we're putting really hard rigid product on top it can change the properties of the actual full-on nail surface and that can be really weird and then same thing the other flip side if the nail that we're we're back filling again it would be more like this this is the original nail product this is the product that i'm back filling with and i'm floating over the top hard underneath with flexible on top is less of an issue but it could depending on when it grows out start to cause problems. And again, it all depends on how much product is left on the nail. It might not matter because, you know, the next service, the person's going to take off all of their nail product. Um, so it's not going to be an issue, but 
I usually try to do like with like. So if you're backfilling something, like you're gonna backfill acrylic with gel, pick a gel that's a little bit more rigid, that's going to match the rigidity of the acrylic surface. If you're backfilling something super flexible, then pick something super flexible to backfill it with. Um, like goes with like, I find. And, uh, and it's good to try and stick with the same product throughout. But again, you guys have seen my nails. I have layer upon layer upon layer of different product that I've used on different videos demonstrating. And so it builds up this hodgepodge of product on my nail. It can cause problems once I start to see them grow out. I start to notice like, hey, these are starting to crack on the sides because of the product that's grown down. But usually by the time you backfill a few times, that layer underneath is so minimal that the original product has pretty much been removed and it's so thin it doesn't have a huge effect on it. This is more for those situations where you're literally just trying to backfill behind and leave most of the, the product on the nail plate. I know that's a long-winded answer, but I hope that makes sense. So do like with like. You're going to be in a safe zone if you stick with that kind of plan. Okay. Um, question number four. My sticky layer has color in it. Should I be alarmed? All right. So let's actually take a quick look. All right. So what I did here is I cured two dollops of the same product on a nail form. Let me just zoom in here a little bit. Okay, so this one I did a full cure on, and this one I under cured a little bit. And I don't have white gloves. Don't touch uncured product with your bare fingers. But I only have pink and black gloves, which isn't going to show you guys what this looks like. So I'm going to use a white um, wipe here. So this is the fully cured product. So if I just press on it and pull up, can you see there's like a teeny hint of pink on there? And then if I press on this one, there's a lot more, okay? So can you see that? So this is the original one, this is the second one. So depending on, depending on how much pigment is coming off can tell you a couple of different things. So since the inhibition layer, and if you guys watch my Why Are My Gel Nails Sticky video on my channel, this will explain everything you need to know about inhibition layers. Inhibition layers essentially are the layer of gel that is exposed to oxygen while curing or while polymerization is happening. And oxygen actually prevents that small thin layer from curing. So we've got this uncured layer of gel. So it's basically liquid uncured product. That's why we don't wanna to touch it with our bare fingers. Um, and anytime you're, you're working over a sticky layer, like let's say you're tapping in powder or glitter, use a gloved hand to protect your skin because um, uncured product is how we get those things absorbing into our bodies. And that's also how we can eventually lead to potential allergies down the road. So you definitely wanna keep in mind, don't touch any sticky layers with your bare hands. And if you're cleaning jars or whatever, wear gloves. Okay, so if you've got this situation where a lot of pigment is coming off, it could be that your gel is not curing properly. That could be because it's not being cured long enough. It could also be that the lamp that you are using is not potent enough to actually cure the gel completely, even if you are curing for the right amount of time. The big thing with UV lamps is emittance, and it's unfortunate that in the industry we don't talk about emittance very much. We often talk about wattage, which is how much power that the lamp consumes or how much power the bulbs and or LEDs are consuming during the whole process that it's on. Um, it can tell you essentially how much power those bulbs are using, which then can be kind of referenced into how much power the lamp has, but it's not really telling you how much UV or what range of wavelength of UV is being emitted by your lamp. Depending on the quality of the bulbs or the quality of the light emitting diodes, the LEDs, it depends on how much light is actually coming out of that, how potent the light is, and how much overall brightness and luminosity that the lamp is providing. And all of those different factors key, have a key role in curing our gels properly. So if a lot of pigment is coming off, then and if, especially if it looks kind of liquidy, it's, it's gonna be a red flag that your gel is not curing properly. If very little amount, even this, honestly, slightly being under cured and that much pigment coming off, I mean, it does tell me, hey, this, you know, this didn't cure completely because I've got one that's fully cured compared to one that's under cured. So that tells me that's what the natural amount of pigment is going to be. And remember, 
that inhibition layer, that sticky layer on top of the nail is uncured gel. So if I've got uncured color gel on top, then it's going to have some pigment in it and the pigment is going to come off. And you can see very little amount of uncured gel was on top, but there is some uncured gel and the pigment is inside. So it would stand to reason that there's going to be a little bit of pigment that's gonna come off in that inhibition, that sticky layer, okay? So just because a little bit of pigment comes off like this doesn't mean there's anything happening that's bad, but if there's a lot of pigment coming off or it's still ooey gooey, then that is a big red flag that something is going wrong with the curing process and you need to kind of revisit. Is it the gel that's the issue? Is it the lamp that it's, that's the issue? Or is it the combination of the two things being used together that's the issue, okay? Um, okay, and that leads into question number five, mixing products. So a lot of you have asked me about mixing products and it seems that the general theme around this question of mixing products is because you guys already own several nail products and you want to be able to use all of them in one service or you want to be able to take advantage of them or you're concerned about mixing different brands. Sometimes it's not even mixing different brands, it's mixing different materials together. So a lot of you have asked me about things like sprinkling acrylic powder into your gel, um, sprinkling pigments into your gel, sandwiching nail polish inside gel, like where you have a gel nail and then you put nail polish and then you put gel top coat over top. Some of you asked me about just putting nail polish over the top of gel. Some of you have asked me about putting dip powder over acrylic nails or over gel nails. And a lot of it seems to just be this curiosity factor from you guys about can I do these things together? What are the consequences of putting these things together? Is it going to last? Is it safe? You know, you know, is the world going to blow up if I do this? And the short answer is no. Really, at the end of the day, mixing, matching all of these things isn't necessarily going to cause a catastrophic nightmare, but it is going to add complications to what you're trying to achieve, or it can add complications to the removal process. So a good example is when we have a gel nail where we've put nail polish, regular nail polish on top of the gel nail and we've let it dry and we've put gel top coat over the top. So if you try that, you will notice that if you try to e-file it off or you try to soak off just the nail polish, which I think a lot of you are thinking, oh, I'll put hard gel, then I'll put nail polish over top, but I don't wanna have to put regular nail polish top coat because it takes a long time to dry. I wanna put gel nail top coat so that it dries instantly and I don't have to wait for the dry time and it protects it and it lasts longer. But when I go to remove it, I don't wanna remove my hard gel nails. I just wanna remove the nail polish portion of it. And so you're thinking, oh, I could soak off the soak off layers above the hard gel and my hard gel will be left over underneath. Okay, so if you attempt that, you'll notice that number one, the nail polish doesn't swell and flake and peel off like soak off gel does. It actually just turns into kind of a sticky mess. And a lot of times the top coat on top kind of creates this weird barrier where you're not actually able to get the nail polish off. So you end up having to file off the top coat, then try to get the nail polish off with acetone. A lot of times the nail polish will stain the hard gel underneath, which then kind of defeats the purpose of all of this. And if you're e-filing nail polish, then you'll notice that nail polish gets really gooey and starts to stick to even carbide bits and creates this kind of mess that you've got to deal with. So can you do it? Absolutely you can do it. But I find that mixing all of those things together just starts to create this kind of weird mess of stuff that I have to remember how I did it, number one. And number two, when I go to remove it or backfill it, I've got this kind of weird hybrid mess that now I've got to figure out how to maneuver around doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means that it's a little annoying. I find it annoying. And so I don't usually mix nail polish into the situation. I don't own a lot of nail polish. I know some of you guys do. I probably own maybe, shoot, three bottles of nail polish, maybe. Um, and I, I just like to stick with gel because I just really like it. Um, but I know some of you have a lot of nail polish and then when you're dabbling with gel, you kind of want to mix the two together. You can do it. I just think you guys are going to run into some annoyances with either the backfilling or the removal process. And the other thing too, is when you put anything soak off over a hard gel, or if you're putting again, soak off over a, an acrylic service, acrylic does soak off with acetone. It may not soak off completely, but if you were to put wraps on it to try and get just the soak off or the nail polish layers off of the enhancement, it will start to eat away at the enhancement underneath. And same thing goes for hard gel, even hard gel, can be slightly broken down by acetone. It won't come off like soak off gel does, but you'll notice that it does kind of 
eat away at the edges of your hard gel and it sometimes also makes it soft or kind of crumbly and weird. Um, and again, you can file through those layers that the acetone is eaten away at and get back to like the true hard gel underneath, but it just adds all of these other elements. So I don't typically soak off things on top of other things. I usually just e-file dry, but I have found that nail polish is really annoying to e-file. With dip powder, it's less of an issue, especially if you're using like the traditional dip with the cyanoacrylate glue resins. Um, you can also sprinkle, you know, powdered acrylic into your gel on top if you want to do that. All of those things are perfectly fine. And I know some of you guys didn't like my, my video on dip systems, but again, I just find that a lot of these other products don't really serve me that well. They're annoying. Um, and I just find that they're more frustration than they are benefits. And so I just stick with one product line and, you know, and just dry e-file everything. I don't even bother putting acetone on anything, um, unless I really, really, really need to get down to the natural nail. And then I'll plan ahead for that for, um, you know, again, like maybe this is a temporary service and I know I'm just going to take it off later. Um, that can be for several situations. So anyway, long story short, yes, you can mix almost any product together, but the Thing where we get into trouble is that whole conversation about the different rigidities and flexibilities of products being mixed together that is going to cause service breakdown and then the other issue with it is that if you've just got kind of different chemicals working together or if you're trying to mix a whole bunch of things together in one lamp you might run into situations where things aren't curing properly and that can lead to not only service breakdown but again it can lead to the whole allergy conversation so you know yes you can you know, create literally like, I, I always think of like suicide drink, you know, at the the drink fountain. If you guys were into that when you were younger, it was like, you'd mix all the sodas together and see what it tasted like. I know that we all have that natural curiosity to mix things. Um, and you know, us as kids also like almost all kids will take a plate of food if they're not hungry and like start mashing things together and make science experiments. I think a lot of us have a natural inclination to make science experiments. But when you're doing it in a professional sense, I definitely think that that needs to be taken away from the conversation. You definitely should not be experimenting at all as a nail professional. You should know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it because you've got a client in play and a paying client in play at that. And then if you're doing it on yourself, you also want to make sure that you're not doing things that are ultimately going to end up hurting you. I mean, I think those situations are rare, but at the same time, it is a risk. And I don't want people's passion or nail hobbies to turn into a nightmare like it has for several people that I've spoken to. So those two things really um, eliminate that wanting to make science experiments, you know, in my free time. Um, if you want to test things out, test it on a nail form. I mean, I've shown you guys in a lot of my previous videos about testing out different products. And if you're worried about backfilling with something else or mixing two things together, hey, make an actual, you know, um, kind of mock-up of the nail that you're going to make, you know, take a nail form, add the layers like you would, and then peel it off and see how that feels. You know, does the hard gel underneath cause problems? Does the hard gel on top cause problems? Does it snap? Does it crack? Does it crumble? Um, you know, what does it feel like? How does it soak off? You know, you can definitely practice a lot of those things on either a fake, uh, hand or on a nail form without actually putting it on your natural nails to begin with. I say practice on some inanimate object first before you put it on yourself, okay? So hopefully that answers that question. Um, question number six is why do some brands only sell to professionals? And actually it's funny because a lot of my colleagues on YouTube have done full on videos about this conversation and um, it's a difficult question to answer and I think I might have actually commented on this before, if I recall, it's hard to remember every single thing I've ever said on YouTube. Um, but honestly, the whole professional only product thing, and you know that I work with some professional only products, and then I have products where the manufacturers don't really care, um, or it's just, you know, a product that's kind of more open ended and, and, you know, it's, it's for anyone who wants to purchase it. And obviously there's a ton of brands of product out there that are available on eBay, Amazon, Wish, AliExpress, whatever that people can buy no matter what. So this whole conversation becomes kind of frustrating because a lot of DIYers will see professionals like me using professional grade product that, you know, you can't buy and it creates this kind of exclusivity factor that can be really annoying and some of you take it personally and, you know, and feel like, hey, why can't I use high quality product? 
So just because something is pro only or it's open ended doesn't mean that one is more high quality than the other. There are lots of pro only products out there that I've seen that are not the best quality. And there's some products out there that I've seen that are completely open to anyone who wants to buy them and they are amazing quality. It just depends on what they're, you know, who's manufacturing them, um, what's in them, what price point they're being offered at. I mean, it runs the gambit. Now, as far as the companies that only want to sell to professionals, here's kind of a short story as to why that's the case. A lot of these brands were founded by professional nail technicians, and so they inherently have kind of a protective passion for fellow professionals because being a nail technician is not easy. I know it sounds like it's all fun and glitz and glamour, but honestly, just like creating any small business from scratch, being a nail professional can be extremely challenging. Not only do we have to invest a lot of time and energy into honing our skills at a, to a level that we can actually charge for them and keep people happy and you know keep positive reviews flowing in, we have to invest in a lot of things like continuing education. Obviously, we have to pay for all of our business overhead, like rents, um, all of our products, um, equipment, things like that, utilities, all of that kind of stuff. And so... When it comes to professionals, a lot of brands who were started by professionals kind of want to offer something exclusively to their colleagues and say, hey, you know, we're here for you. We've got your back. We understand that this job is challenging and that, you know, we want to support our community of professional nail technicians. And so they make that choice. Additionally, and on top of that, professional grade products usually are more complicated than more simplistic systems. As you guys have seen, there are tons of different types of primers, bonders, dehydrators, builder gels, base gels, top coats, colors, art gels, powders, you know, all of these different things that go into a professional grade system, obviously with all the different tools, e-files, bits, all of these different things. As a professional, you have to learn how to use all of those. And in one system, there can be hundreds of products. And so it kind of lends itself to the conversation where you really need to understand fully what these products are and how to use them inside and out. And a lot of DIYers either aren't going to own all of these products or they're not really interested in getting that involved with every single different product that's in there. And so companies are concerned about people hurting themselves, not understanding how to use their product and bad mouthing it or throwing it in a drawer and it's a waste of money. Obviously, the professional grade products are usually more expensive. So again, it naturally kind of lends itself to professionals who are charging for services or the ones that would be paying for product at that level. And it doesn't mean that DIYers aren't smart and can't figure out how to use product. I was a DIYer at one point and every single nail technician on the planet was a DIYer at some point. But you can understand that if there's that level of extra investment that goes into professional services, that the professional grade product and the companies that make it are kind of investing in that professional and also they want to make sure that they are able to feel confident in their products being out there in the marketplace and that the people using it are going to use it appropriately. They're going to speak highly of it and it's going to be successful for the services that are being done because you could imagine if someone just grabs a random branded product, starts using it and then these days starts spouting off on social media about how this product sucks you know, this company supposedly is amazing and I bought their expensive ass product and I used it and it sucks and this, that, and the other thing, you could imagine that that could be very detrimental to a business. So that's why it's kind of kept under more of a protective shield. Um, and it's funny because, you know, the, the professional conversation really depends on what country you're from. In the U.S., we have licensing. So that's usually the determining factor between who's a working professional and who's not. But I've also met a ton of licensed professionals who really aren't professionals. They just happen to have a license. They don't invest in their education. They don't know what they're doing. They buy cheap products and they don't really care about what they're, you know, it's kind of like, it's just like they just did it because they thought, you know, it was better than some other alternative. And then I've also met DIYers that are way more passionate than some of the nail techs that I've met. They know everything about every single product and they get really frustrated when they can't get their hands on professional grade products. And I completely understand that frustration. But just understand that it's not because the company is trying to keep 
good things from you. It's just that's the way their business was built. That's the way their brand has been structured. That's the market that they're in. And it's very difficult for a company to change gears without making trade-offs. And that's where that whole thing comes into play. The other thing too that you have to take into consideration is that every company that sells nail products and every professional manufacturing company out there usually has to have liability insurance for their products as well. Okay, so then you go to the whole actual CYA part of it, which is some insurance will not cover you. They won't cover every single scenario under the sun. Or if they do, it costs an arm and a leg because you're opening up the pool of people that could potentially get harmed. Again, it doesn't mean that they're making bad product. It just means that someone inadvertently uses something. They don't know how to use it. They end up hurting themselves, even though your product is perfectly safe. So again, it could be even the conversation of the insurance is too expensive for them to actually make a product at that price point because that just adds all of that extra expense. It's just there's so many different moving pieces. And at the end of the day, it's that company's personal choice. I mean, these manufacturers and any small business owner, even if they get to a big company level, doesn't matter if the company's worth $100 million, those companies started at, from scratch at one point. They made decisions as they went along. They created their own brand identity, their own niche in the market, and they want to stay true to what that is, and that's just their personal choice. So don't take it personally. It has nothing to do with trying to you know, stick it to you or whatever. It's just that that's their personal choice, and there are brands out there that are very high quality that don't have that same restriction, and so for those of you that are worried about it, um, you know, don't get hung up on the whole pro only thing. I, I do, you know, see a time and a place for it. And, um, there's a lot of other stuff out there. Again, it runs the gamut on both sides of the fence. Don't take it personally. Just realize that there's a lot behind it for each individual brand that makes that choice. And, and it's really just a personal choice and it's really specific to that particular company. And it has nothing to do with trying to keep, you know, safe product away from the DIYers. It really isn't even about that. Um, so I hope, you know, that answers that question and I know it is frustrating, but it's just, it's just part of the way that, you know, this industry works. Okay. Um, all right. So we are on question number seven. Can you sharpen drill bits? Unfortunately, no, you cannot sharpen drill bits. Drill bits do have a lifespan, um, depending on how often you use them. This lifespan can last anywhere from three to six months or even longer if you don't use them very often. That's why you'll see me own several of one particular bit so that I can rotate through. And also I like to make sure that I have clean, sterilized bits for each individual client while I'm working. So I have enough bits to get through a whole day's worth of services. And then I'm able to clean all of my implements, including bits at the end of the day and have a fresh range for the next day. Um, so if you are working at a professional level, I highly recommend you invest in tools so that you're able to do that same thing. It saves so much time between services and make sure that you are ready to go. And it also helps rotate your equipment so that it's not getting worn out as quickly. Um, but no, unfortunately you cannot sharpen drill bits. You need to fully replace them. Okay. Um, over curing and under curing. All right. So over curing and under curing is also something that has been made a pretty big issue. If you've come across, um, some of this topic before, you'll notice that it is one of those things that a lot of people spout off about and say, Hey, you know, this is a major issue. Under curing, in my opinion, is the biggest issue. Under curing is where we get things that are gloopy, they start to, um, they start to pucker and peel. And you, you know, sometimes you'll do a service that looks great. And then within a few hours, it'll start to kind of get gushy underneath. You'll push on it. The whole gel will peel off. Um, I did that in, uh, in a very early video on my channel talking about like the common nail gel issues with, you know, especially pigmented gels that don't cure properly or um, things that can go wrong with service breakdown. So under curing is definitely way more of an issue than over curing. Over curing, the problem with over curing is that we're talking about exposing the gel to more light, more UV light than it was intended to be exposed to. And this is, I mean, acrylic liquid and polymer enhancements actually will, liquid and powder, sorry, will actually, um, continue to polymerize for a much longer period than UV gel does. 
UV gel usually stops polymerizing shortly after it's been exposed to UV light, whereas acrylic will actually continue to polymerize sometimes for up to a month or more. And that's why acrylic nails over time can continue to get more hard and more brittle, again, depending on the system and depending on the way that it's formulated. But that polymerization process is much slower than gel is. Gel's polymerization process, the curing process is much shorter. And in general, I'm just gonna talk in generalities, even if you continue to expose gel to UV light, it doesn't really continue to polymerize it more. Once you have the polymerization process done, the over curing can usually affect more things like the photo initiators in the gel service, which can make it yellow. So over curing things, you'll notice like it might make the gel yellow. Um, sometimes it can make the gel more brittle, but over curing, in my opinion, is way less of a problem. You guys have seen me flash cure and cure nails multiple times, depending on what I'm doing. And especially for curing layers of stuff, like let's say we did base, two coats of color. Now we're going to do each individual layer of nail art, and then we're going to put top coat on top of it. Obviously there might be areas on the nail that are getting cured. 10 times, sometimes more, depending on what it is. And then the flash curing plus full curing, you might be curing more than the 30 seconds that are required or more than the 60 seconds that are required. Don't worry so much about the over curing thing. The risks of the over curing are simply just that issue of the yellowing or the um, more kind of brittle nail texture. But I have found that in most gel services, the over curing is like, like non-existent like you wouldn't even notice that you over cured a nail obviously um the under curing is going to be way more of an issue because that's where we've got the under cured product we've got the um, under polymerized product we've got those monomers floating around we've got things that can absorb into the skin um you know we've got things like chemo that are water soluble and so when you're washing your hands and you've got under cured product it can actually you know be moving around once the water touches it it can move the hema around onto your skin um, every time you wash your hands stuff like that so there are a lot more issues with the under curing conversation and that's why people are so adamant especially nail manufacturers are so adamant about being really careful about the nail lamp that you're using because mixing an unpowerful nail lamp with a gel system can lead to all of those different issues. You may go your whole entire life and never run into an allergy or into an issue with that. And you know, for those of you that have been lucky with that, that's totally fine. But there are a select few that have had issues with that and that's where the issue is stemming from. It's stemming from the ingredients in the gel formula and it's stemming from the under curing with whether it's a, you know, just not getting enough time in the lamp um, or the mixing and matching of a lamp that is not able to actually fully cure the gel product that you're working with okay um all right so let me go on to just a few more all right what is the difference between a gel overlay and an acrylic overlay so an overlay is simply a word that describes when we put one product on top of another we're laying one product over another which is an overlay so if i've got my natural nail and i'm putting gel on top of it it is an overlay if I have my natural nail and I'm putting acrylic over it, that is an overlay, an acrylic overlay. If I'm putting, I've got a nail, natural nail and I'm putting a dip system over the top of it, that is a dip system overlay. So overlay really just describes that I'm putting something over something else. And usually an overlay will reference when we're just dealing with whatever length already exists and we're just merely putting product on top of it. I like to use the word extension for when I'm not only putting product on the nail, but I'm also going to add artificial length with product. So I call that, you can call it artificial enhancements if you want to, but artificial enhancements is kind of like the big umbrella. Underneath artificial enhancements, I like to think of it as extensions, whether that be with a tip or whether that be with a form and my product. And then an overlay is laying product on top of a surface that already exists length that already exists and you might also hear people refer to a tip overlay so that is when you have a tip on the nail and you're laying product over the tip so overlay just means laying product on top of something else and it can and it can be you know you an overlay can be done with any litany of, of products that are out there um, heck you could even say you're doing a nail polish overlay because you're laying nail polish over 
something else. So overlay is just a generic word that helps describe that we're keeping all of the length the same and like tip overlay, you've already got the tip and the length there. You're just putting product on top of it. So I like to reference overlays for more natural nail care when we've just got natural nail length, whatever the client has, we're just going to put product on top of it. And then the extensions is when I'm going to add artificial length with my product or with tips or with our, you know full coverage nail tips in that case. Um, and we're going to then put stuff over top, okay? Um, all right, so, oh, several of you have actually commented this several times on my channel, and it's about filing both directions on the natural nail free edge. I thought, and a lot of you have said, oh, I thought that shreds the natural nail, I thought that adds roughness and it creates, you know, peeling or, or flaking or even cracking with the natural nail. And that's basically you guys talking about when I take a nail file and I'm filing both ways when I'm working on the nail surface. Um, to be honest, if I was only doing natural nail care, I would probably use a very, very, very fine grit nail file. And yes, you could file into the center or you could file one direction, depending on which way um, you want to do that. A lot of it now is being taught that you file from one side to the other, all in one direction to create a seamless surface so that there's no kind of roughness. And again, the roughness is, you know, basically microscopic, but... Um, but a lot of you have commented on the fact that I file both directions. When we're working with artificial product on top of the natural nail, I don't really care what happens to the natural nail on the free edge underneath because the gel or the acrylic or whatever it is is going to encapsulate that, it's going to cover it, and we're capping the free edge of the natural nail. So even if I file both directions or I'm beveling underneath and I'm filing both directions, even if it roughs up the natural nail, I mean, literally, I've never seen an effect from that whatsoever. And... The goal with anyone who gets their nails done by me is that they continue to be able to have artificial nails, whether it be an overlay, extensions, whatever it is, and that they're going to maintain that service. They're not just going to get it once and take it off. Um, I've actually never had a client just get nails and then take it off and never, you know, do nails again. So, um, so in that case, I mean, yeah, if you're worried about the natural nail underneath and you want to file everything in one direction, you can absolutely do that. But since I'm putting artificial product, whether it's gel polish, acrylic, gel, builder gel, you know, whatever, and, you know, depending on what products you guys use, um, since we're putting artificial product over the natural nail, I don't really care about which direction I file the natural nail underneath, whether it's beveling or shortening or whatever, it's all going to get kind of encapsulated and the artificial product is going to be the thing that matters more. And filing in both directions on artificial product doesn't make a lick of difference. Okay. Um, this is a great question. I really liked this one. I finished with lotion and cuticle oil, and then I found a bump or a rough patch on the nail. How do I fix it? And in some of my videos, you guys will notice I talked about putting, um, cuticle oil on the, on the finger, massaging it in, you know, kind of finishing the service for my client. You can do a hand massage with lotion afterwards, which is really nice, a really nice touch to add. And it just feels good, especially after all that. You can kind of clean the nails really well, maybe do a hot towel feels really good after all the dust and all of the, the work that's being done. Doing that final moisturizing and care for the client is really nice. Um, or even for you know your friend or your mom or yourself or whoever you're working on. So the question is really geared around, okay, so if I've got all these oils now on the nail, and I need to fix this, what the heck do I do? Because obviously gel and oil don't mix and we don't wanna have any of those moisturizing agents on the nail when we're going to reapply gel, like if we need to reapply our top coat. So what I would recommend is, even if you've used soak off product, I would recommend using acetone to clean the nail and really well, clean all around. And if the person already has a bunch of lotion on their hands and you feel this little bit, if it's on the free edge and you can just quickly file it without taking off every, you know, all the lotion and everything, just try and buff or file that one little spot that's on the free edge or on the sidewall. If it's in the middle of the nail and it's like right there and it's going to affect the shininess, shininess of the top coat, then you have a couple options. If there's very little oil underneath or lotion underneath the length and you're just literally going to fix the top coat portion, Acetone is a great agent to strip oil off. So if you cleanse the nail really well and the surrounding skin with acetone, it will really strip all of those oils off of the nail, uh, nail plate much better than if you were to use alcohol. Alcohol it is better at killing bacteria, but it will kind of spread things around. 
um, acetone will strip oil right off. So you can absolutely wipe a few times, really get in the grooves, get all around, cleanse, cleanse, cleanse with several different, you know, maybe like three different clean wipes every time to make sure that you're not just spreading the oil around, clean it really, really, really well and underneath. If the person already does have like, let's say you did a paraffin dip or you've got lotion on and like lotions all over the place, have them go wash the finger with a scrubby brush, um, like, like this guy and with some, you know, antibacterial soap, or even if you have like a dish type soap or something that you use to clean your tools with something that really strips oil like Dawn or Paul Mollive or something, um, then have them scrub it with that kind of soap because that will also strip all the oils off of there and it'll help get the lotion and the oil out from underneath their nail and out from under the sidewalls. And then in just that finger is all they need to do. And then, um, or you can do it in a manicure bowl if you have one at your table. Um, typically, you know, you'll have like a sink or something in your salon that you can, you know, do that with or just have a bowl with warm water and some soap and just really clean that really well, then cleanse with acetone. Then you can buff that spot or file it, depending on how bad it is, um, reapply your top coat. I recommend that if you're going to do a whole new layer of top coat, buff the whole entire nail surface so that you know that you've removed all of that and you're going to get one cohesive layer of top coat on top and it's not going to chip or peel or whatever the case might be. And, um, and then you can absolutely go ahead and reapply. Usually that works like a charm. And then again, you can do your cuticle oil and lotion on that particular finger right afterwards. But most importantly is even though I check for little weird quirky things on the nails while I'm moisturizing and while I'm rubbing around with cuticle oil, I do visually check and touch the nails prior to putting lotion and cuticle oil on. So I do look and see if there's any little pieces of grit or something or dust that flew into my top coat and created a little bump. Um, I do feel them before I put all of these moisturizing things on. I just like to do that with cuticle oil because it kind of helps me feel anything that the client might feel. And then normally those are things that are on the free edge and I can just file off really quickly, but I'm not talking about like major imperfections on the surface. So also do a visual check before you go and do all of your lotion, oil, paraffin, whatever the case might be, um, because it's better to catch that before you put all of that greasy stuff on. Okay. And then um, I've got two more questions and I know that we're going on like almost an hour with this video, but again, Q and A's, I feel like warrant, you know, actual long winded explanations. Cause a lot of you guys have asked me these questions several times. So without further ado, grit for nail files, what grit should you be using for nail files? Okay. So this is a great question as well. Natural nails. So the lower the number, like if you're looking at 50, a hundred, whatever, the lower the number. Okay the less particles of grit per centimeter or square inch, depending on how it's measured. So the less means the rougher, kind of like, you know, beds that are made out of nails. The reason why people can lay on beds made of nails is because the nails are so close together that it actually, the surface area um, helps to distribute the weight. So grit on nail files is very similar. The more grit particles we have in one particular spot, like per centimeter, the finer it's going to be because instead of it being jagged on the top and really having a lot of texture that's going to file a lot, it actually has many bits of grit together, which is going to create basically a smoother surface. It's going to file more smoothly. And so the lower the number, the more gritty something is, the higher the number, the more fine something is. So for natural nails, I recommend no lower than 180 grit for a nail file. Even 180 grit is still pretty gritty for a natural nail. So you might want to use, um, if you're doing natural nail care, you might want to use something that's more like 220 or 240, depending on what kind of nail files you can find. Um, those glass nail files that a lot of you guys have asked me about are very high. They're probably 240 or beyond. 240 grit feels very, very smooth and it's very, very um, fine. 180 is kind of in between. And the reason why I like to use 180 is because it's safe for natural nails and it's not going to ravage natural nails, but it's also gritty enough that I can use it for prepping the natural nail plate and also filing gel. I love filing gel with 180. I find that it's the perfect grit to be able to shape, shorten, and all of those things without taking too much off and without making the nail surface really rough. 180, 50, something like that would be for like, you need to take off three inches of acrylic 
um, and you need to file through that puppy. So the grittier, the more the product needs to be hard. Acrylic is much more hard than gel is when it comes to filing. Like you can file for days sometimes on acrylic nails and it won't budge. Um, so you can use a more like 100 grit, 120, 80, depending on what, you know, what your, your uh, preference is. But the reason why I use 180 is because I can use it on gel and I can use it on natural nails and I have one grit of nail file that I can use across all of my services. If you're doing natural nail care, you might want to reach more for a 240 grit. Um, something in that ballpark is going to be nicer and smoother, especially if you're just doing like nail polish manicures and you really need to make sure that the nail edge is super smooth. Um, 240 is going to be a better uh, bet for you. Okay, and last question for my Q&A session is other ways to control dust. So you guys have seen me use dust collectors on here, like the Zephros. I love the Zephros. I love the disposable filters. There are tons of dust collectors out there on the market. I mean, there's some that are up high and suck things up. There's some that are hoses that suck dust in directly from your table. There's some that you install in your table and suck dust down. Um, there's ones that use all different kinds of disposable filters, reusable filters, bags, uh, whatever. There's like so many dust collectors out there. And I know a lot of you have tried a lot of them. Some of you don't have a dust collector or you don't want to buy one because you're like, hey, this is expensive. I don't want to waste money on something that I'm not going to use very often or I'm just doing my nails once in a blue moon. Um, and actually somebody asked me this and they said, hey, I've got like a shop vac that I can put a HEPA filter in. Could I just use a shop vac? And I was like, yeah, you could totally do that. So you could absolutely even use your household vacuum for doing your nails. If you want to literally, I do this sometimes too, um, but the caveat here is I will put like the hose of my vacuum cleaner and sometimes I'll either tape it to the table or I'll actually just like hold it between my knees and file over it if I'm just doing my own nails real quick. Um, and I do find that it works really well. But the caveat is, is that my household vacuum cleaner uses water as the filter. I have a, what's called a rainbow vacuum. And so it is like, basically it's like a big hookah. It pulls all the dust and dirt through water and then um, everything gets filtered through the water. So the dust is able to get captured by the water. If you don't have a water vacuum, which I'm sure most of you don't have a water vacuum and you've probably maybe not even ever heard of a water vacuum, I'm kind of a vacuum freak. I love home cleaning, like I'm a clean person. And so I am what you would call an aficionado when it comes to vacuums. And that's like totally random thing to share here on my channel, but I love vacuums. Like I've owned probably like, I don't know, 20 or 30 vacuums over my adult life. And I just love them. I love stick vacuums. I love water, va like probably my favorite is water vacuums. Rainbow is the brand if you guys wanna look into it. I think they are the coolest thing but I'm not gonna get into this whole thing about vacuums. Anyway, um, the biggest thing with nail dust is nail dust is super fine, super, super fine, even more fine than the dust in your household. So the problem with using a vacuum cleaner, a regular vacuum cleaner with nail dust is that you're actually ultimately gonna kill your vacuum because that super, super fine nail dust is going to be able to get into the motor of your vacuum. It's going to bog down your vacuum motor and usually what will happen is your motor will overheat and it'll die. So the biggest key, if you're going to be using a vacuum cleaner of any kind, whether it's a shop vac, a house vac, you can even use like those little, you know, portable one or two horsepower, um, like little uh, portable bag vacuums, you have to use HEPA filters, okay? Um, and usually you want a vacuum that has multi-stage filters so don't just whip out your Dyson and start vacuuming you know, your nail dust because even that is gonna get through the, the filtering system. You really need to use a vacuum that has HEPA bags, HEPA filters, and again, multi-stage filters. Otherwise, that fine particle dust is gonna get into your household vacuum and it's gonna kill it. And household vacuums aren't cheap either. So just keep that in mind. Absolutely, you can use a regular shop vac or a regular household vacuum but it needs to have HEPA grade filters in order to be able to trap a lot of that nail dust. And even with HEPA grade filters, I have seen nail dust be able to get through those filters and it will be on the inside of the vacuum. So just keep that in mind. If you're doing it once in a blue moon, I think it's totally fine. I don't think it's going to kill your vacuum cleaner, but if you're doing it like day in and day out and trying to get around it and you're just using some like random filter, it will kill your, your appliance. So I don't want you guys to be going around killing your vacuum cleaners doing this. 
use HEPA grade filters. Otherwise, it's going to get into your motor. It's going to cause problems, okay? Um, all right, so that's all the questions I had for today. I've got some great videos that I'm going to um, put together regarding a lot of other questions that you guys have had. And um, I, you know, as always, I really enjoy reading your guys' questions, reading your guys' feedback. It makes me so happy to see that these videos help a lot of you understand nails better, specifically gel nails, since I'm a gel freak. Um, and I hope all of this, you know, helps you become better at loving your nail hobby or loving your nail career. And I will be in touch again soon. All right. Bye, guys.